Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived unexpectedly in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born King of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Messiah would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, because out of you will come a leader who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. After hearing the king, they went on their way. And there it was, the star they'd seen in the east. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed beyond measure. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, Keep your Bibles open there. We're going to spend a little bit of time uh, in this passage uh, there's an outline there inside your newsletters if you like to take notes or see where we are in what's going on, and God willing, there'll be a brief moment to ask questions at the end. Uh, the signs of Christmas are pretty easy to recognise. Uh, lights, music, sales, colours, terrible shirts that you wear to church. We all know the signs of Christmas. We all recognise the signs and we all react to them. Uh, For some, it's a moment they've been waiting for all year and the signs are received with overwhelming joy. Uh, For some, Christmas is a moment of overwhelming emotion, emotion of every sort. And for some, Christmas is greeted with a level of apathy and disinterest. We all recognise the signs, we all react And waiting for Christmas is a combination of these two. Let me pray, and we're going to look at recognising and reacting. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks for Matthew. Thank you for the way in which he gives us such a vibrant and colourful and personal and confronting account of the birth of Jesus. Father, thank you that we can wait for the return of Jesus, and as we do, help us to consider his first coming, and what that means. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, We're in the season of Advent. Uh, It's a four-week period in the church calendar leading up to Christmas, a period of waiting and arrival. You'll actually see on the front of your newsletter uh, the collect for this week, the second prayer of Advent, something you can use as you read your Bibles during the week. Uh, During Advent, we get a chance to look backwards, back to the first arrival of Jesus and all that this brought. And as we look backwards, we also look forwards, getting ready for the second arrival of Jesus, for his return. Uh, This year we're using Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus to help us, and Matthew covers the events of Jesus' birth very clearly, very concisely, and with a number of times where he causes us to pause and to look a long way backwards to God's preparation for Christmas. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the day of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived unexpectedly in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who's been born King of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Point two on your outline, Jesus has been born. Matthew now tells us where. He tells us Jesus was born in Bethlehem, a small town about 10 or 20 kilometres from Jerusalem, the capital. Matthew now mentions when Jesus was born. King Herod was the ruler in Jerusalem. He'd been king for close on 30 years by the birth of Jesus 
And he was an incredibly talented man. He was renowned for his ability as an athlete. He was regarded as the bravest and most capable of soldiers. He was an administrator who made sure the public service and public works worked well. He had great fame as an orator. He was going to die soon and in his old age, he'd become increasingly paranoid. Paranoid about every threat to his throne. In his latter years, he became so paranoid that he murdered his wife and three of his sons, fearing they wanted to take his power. And Matthew now mentions the first visitors in his account to the new baby, wise men from the east. Uh, Their arrival is completely unexpected. Uh, Their arrival is countercultural. God's people never really held stargazers in high regard. In fact, right throughout the Bible, astrologers and those who follow the stars are clearly understood to be outside the people of God. And yet they're the first visitors because they've recognised a sign. We saw his star in the east. These are men who spend their lives looking at the galaxies. They have unbelievable astrological knowledge and observation and so when something strange appears in the night sky, they recognise it. They notice it. They note it. And for them, such an event could only be connected to something earth-shattering, something connected with royalty. And so they've come probably, well, we've got a number of guesses, Arabia, Babylon, Persia, Egypt, some even suggest China. In all of those places, there were significant Jewish communities already by this stage. And so these wise men who know the world around them and who have devoured many manuscripts are familiar with the nation of the Jews and familiar with the Old Testament, and they have reacted. They recognised and they reacted. They have come to worship him. And worship's a really simple word. It's giving what someone deserves. Giving what someone deserves. They've come to give the king what's due to him. And such a king whose arrival is shown in the heavens by a brand new star, such a king must be worth a lot. Do you see how Matthew's starting to encourage us to recognise and react in a really strange way? He's not doing it in an expected way, is he? He's grabbed an outsider group and he's held them up as people worth paying attention to. When King Herod heard this, I'm at point three on the outline, when King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. King Herod recognises the signs, doesn't he? He recognises a rival. He recognises a threat, at least to the minds of the wise men from the east. Uh, Their arrival in Jerusalem had been disturbing enough. This isn't three men and a donkey. This is a party of maybe even a thousand people. Imagine a thousand people suddenly turning up in Narrabri in one hit. You'd notice them, wouldn't you? You'd pay attention to them, especially when they come saying, we're looking for the new king. No wonder Herod is disturbed. And their quest is disturbing too, isn't it? I mean, let alone that number of people turning up and let alone that question. And so Herod lays plans to find out where the pretender is to be born. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Messiah would be born. He might have been king of the Jews, but he didn't know the book of the Jews, did he? He might have been king of the Jews, but he calls his religious experts in, uh, men who knew their Bible back to front, who by the age of 12 had to know the first five books in Hebrew by heart, who knew it by memory, and so he asks them, He gets an answer from them, but then he makes sure he covers his bases. It would not be good if this got out into the general population that the real king had been born. And so he gathers the wise men in verses 7 to 8 and says, hey, listen, when you've found him, I'd like to go and give him what he deserves too. No wonder he's ruled for 30 years. has a ripple out effect in the city, doesn't it? Because a disturbed Herod means a disturbed city. (laughs) 
Uh, they're not disturbed like he is. Uh, they're disturbed because when you disturb a tyrant, you know what's going to follow, don't you? How do tyrants reassert their authority? Uh, the city is fearful not of God but of a human and what he might do. The wise men have recognized and reacted and Herod and the populace of Jerusalem have recognized and reacted. What a contrast already in four verses. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, by no means least among the leaders of Judah, because out of you will come a leader who will shepherd my people Israel. Point four on the Allen. These men know their stuff. These men know their stuff, don't they? They don't have to go and say, hang on, give us a second, we'll go and check the scrolls. Uh, They don't even have to consult with each other and look at the cross-references. How immediate is their answer? Bethlehem of Judea. Straight away. Uh, They even have a verse to recite, don't they? From an Old Testament prophet who spoke perhaps 700 years beforehand. Uh, It's a really impressive answer, isn't it? And just as impressive is their apathy. They recognise the signs and their reaction is to ask, what's for dinner? Did you notice that? The saviour of the world, born less than 20 kilometres away and you already knew the GPS coordinates from an Old Testament prophet and you've done nothing. (laughs) You've sat and you've read your scrolls and you've attended to your clubs and your social occasions and your gatherings and your little trivialities. That's what they've done, these religious leaders, isn't it? I think Matthew has placed this episode here so that we as readers today are confronted by recognition and reaction right in front of us. And we cannot avoid the reality that this day was not unplanned. It was not unannounced. It was not unprepared for or unexpected, at least by God and those who really paid attention to his word. Uh, Matthew's placement of this quote from Micah. Now, Micah's a bloke who spoke perhaps six to 700 years beforehand. Uh, Matthew's placement of this quote from Micah in this account encourage us us to look back at those preparations, to go back six or seven hundred years. And Micah was operating in a very different time. He lived and spoke at about the same time as Isaiah. You know that prophet we looked at last week? They overlapped completely. And so we're looking at God's mob gathered around and in Jerusalem about 700 years beforehand. And when Micah speaks, he confronts two key issues. Can I get the next slide, please? Two key issues for God's people. They're the issues of religious apathy and perversion and social injustice. And the two are linked because if God's people treat God badly and treat him like some lucky charm, they'll then abuse those around them, won't they? Listen to this from Micah chapter 3. Listen to this, leaders of the house of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel who abhor justice and pervert everything that's right who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with injustice. Her leaders issue rulings for a bribe. Her priests teach for payment. Her prophets practice divination for money. Next slide, please. Yet they lean on the Lord saying, isn't the Lord among us? No calamity will overtake us. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be ploughed like a field. Jerusalem will become ruins. And the hill of the temple mount will be a thicket. Because you treat God with apathy and so treat each other appallingly, God's going to come and judge you. That's what God spoke through Micah. That's how God spoke to his people. He was going to judge them. Their sin will be judged. And out of that judgment, he would save some of them. That's God's pattern, isn't it? Remember we saw that last week, salvation through judgment. But here in the words of Micah, God actually speaks of a very specific day when this will all end whether people recognise it or not. And God sends this message through Micah at a very moment when God's mob are experiencing the pointy end of his judgment when an external power has invaded them. We're probably around the time of Hezekiah. 
Assyria, the great superpower, has invaded Judah, besieged Jerusalem, 701 BC. They're right up to the base of the city walls. God's mob are huddled in the capital. Everyone has fled there. They're wedged into Jerusalem. And the leaders of the Assyrian army stand at the city gates and mock them and laugh at their leadership. No one else has stood up to Assyria. What makes you think you blokes can do it? Look at you, all hemmed in. Uh, It's described in Isaiah 36 and 2 Kings 18. And in that moment, God speaks a very clear message. Next slide, please. God recognises the reality of his judgment on his people through Assyria. It's humiliating. They're striking the judge of Israel on the cheek with a rod. Look what they're doing to your king under the judgment of God. Next slide, please. God states very clearly that he will raise a rescuer, a new king from Bethlehem, less than 20 kilometres down the road, a city so small that when they did the census of the tribe of Judah, they kept forgetting it. And God states, next slide, please, that this king has been planned from antiquity. And because he's planned from antiquity, God himself will bring it about. Bethlehem has a strong history in God's unlikely plans of grace and mercy. If you know your history, there was a a little girl who went back there called Ruth, remember her? A foreigner who came to settle under the mercy of God and married a local Bethlehem boy made good named Boaz. And Boaz and Ruth had a child called Obed and Obed had a child called Jesse and Jesse had seven boys, the youngest of whom was called David. Remember that genealogy we looked at last week in Matthew chapter 1? And remember that reading that Max brought us as David says in 2 Samuel chapter 7, I want to build a house for God and God says I'm going to build a house for you. In fact, when I build a house for you, I'm going to establish a king from your line who will be called my boy. And that boy will establish a rule of peace that will restore the whole earth. Does that sound a little familiar? But it's not going to happen today, Micah. As you see from this, it'll take time because I have to judge you because you are persistent in your apathy and abuse. But one day, one day, when she who is in labour has given birth, then the rest of his brothers will return to the people of Israel. Next slide, please. And when that happens, God's mob will be reconstituted. The 12 tribes and the whole nation gathered together and there'll be a shepherd. And that shepherd will guard and guide his people so that they will have the peace that he has always promised them. GPS coordinates, Bethlehem. A woman will give birth in Bethlehem. And when that woman gives birth in Bethlehem, there will be global peace. Matthew has four prophecies. Three of them talk about a pattern. One of them talks about a prediction. This is it. Where will the saviour of the world be born? A particular place, a particular person, a particular moment. And, And did you notice from the religious leaders how much God's people had made that part of their DNA? How quickly they answered? Everyone in God's mob knew the history of Bethlehem. Everyone in God's mob knew the family of David. Everyone in God's mob knew the promise of God and the leadership of God's mob had completely missed it. Why? Because the apathy and perversion towards God and others had made them blind. Had caused Herod and the religious leaders and the people of Jerusalem to grow deaf to the arrival of the very promise of God. The very thing that God was talking about against in Micah is the very thing that still remains that God has to deal with in his promised king. The apathy towards God and the apathy towards each other. They remained and they blinded the recognition. Bethlehem, they missed the coming of the one born in Bethlehem the promised king of peace, because they were blinded by their apathy, their opposition and their aggression. But a small group wasn't. Remember them? 
I'm at point five on the outline. Look at verse nine. After hearing the king, they went on their way, these wise men, and it was the, there it was, the star they'd seen in the east. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed beyond measure. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Those men hadn't been removed from the blindness and apathy, but they were not pulled into it, were they? It was there in front of them. They went on their way. They followed the clear sign of the star. Did you see what reaction their recognition brought? Did you see it there? They were overjoyed beyond measure, verse 10. And falling to their knees, they gave this boy what he deserved, verse 11. The gifts that suit a king from people from another corner of the globe. Even that is prepared for by God. Next slide, please. Psalm 72. May the kings of Tarshish and the coasts and the islands bring tribute. The kings of Sheba and Seba offer gifts. And let all kings bow down to him. All nations serve him. Psalm 72. Even a poem written hundreds of years beforehand about that kneeling in Bethlehem. Apathy, aggression, fear, these men are overjoyed. And they worship the king in the way he deserves. We all recognise the signs of Christmas. I'm at the last point on the outline. We all recognise the signs of Christmas and we all react. Uh, Not a new phenomenon. was there at the first Christmas. Recognition and reaction. And as we wait for the return of Jesus, the second coming, uh, Matthew includes this so that we can think about our recognition and our reaction. We can't fail to recognise God's faithfulness, can we? The child will be born in Beth- God does exactly as he promises. He always does. He is completely and utterly trustworthy. The baby was born in Bethlehem after a period of time by a woman and he would bring peace to every corner of the globe. Remember Matthew chapter 121 from last week? So, so let me ask us a question. Do we recognise how trustworthy God is? We cannot fail to recognise the global reach of God's kindness. In fact, that kind of grace is confronting. A bunch of foreigners from outside the people of God recognise Jesus first. Star-worshipping foreigners recognised the very act of God and responded appropriately. The grace of God, his kindness and generosity that is undeserved brings outsiders in. This boy will grow up. This boy will live, die and rise. He'll defeat death and pay the penalty for sin for foreigners, outsiders. And he will clearly display his authority at the end to bring peace to the whole earth. Do we recognise the global reach of God's grace for every type of person? We cannot fail to look in the mirror of Matthew that he presents us here and and go, well, my reaction and my recognition, both to the first and the second coming of Jesus. You, You could choose the aggression of Herod. When God himself comes to threaten a kingdom that a man or a woman has built, with them at the centre, when the true king is born, when God does as he promised. You could go with the fear of Jerusalem, fearing the opinion of others and the reaction that they'll bring. You could go with the apathy of the religious leaders who know their Bibles back to front and can quote it and have impeccable religious and social credentials. Or you could go with the overjoyed worship of the foreigner giving Jesus what he deserves. Here is the mirror for our recognition and response at Christmas. Here is the mirror that examines a bloke like me as I wait for the second arrival of Jesus. What's it going to be, Bernard? Is it going to be aggression? Is it going to be fear? Is it going to be apathy? Or when Jesus returns, will it be overjoyed delight 
that we can give him what he deserves at every moment. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you for these players. Thank you for Matthew who wrote this account that is the revelation of your very being. Father, we pray that as we read it, you'll help us to look at our recognition and our reaction. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he was born to bring your peace to every corner of the globe. Thank you that he achieved that by living, dying and rising for our sins. Father, bring us to him overjoyed, giving him what he deserves. In his name we pray. Amen.